Okay, what's going on, guys? Shitty here. Uh, back again, playing some more Half-Life Alex. It's been a little minute since I played. I don't really remember where I was at. <laughs> but I am back again playing it. Uh, yeah. I I have way more memory, but that's just... It always says that. All right. I tried buying, like, some low-latency earphones. And I have them, but they are shit. Like... I couldn't even tell if the latency is good or not because the audio is so shit in them <clears throat> that they just, they're not worth using. So I'm back to these ones. You might see me move off camera because, oh yeah, the fucking menu. I hate that it has the menu up. Yeah, you might see me move off camera because I'm like this way, for example, because I have my, don't have a ton of space, but figure that out as we go. Okay. This will upgrade. Pop in order upgrade. to reduce the amount of reloading required in the heat of battle, we wanted players to be able to upgrade the pistol by increasing its ammo capacity. That might seem like a small change, but implementing it in a way it, that it's a massive change to me. It really ups out. Didn't have a lot of negative side effects. Was surprisingly tricky to get right. Our initial mechanic for increasing the ammo capacity was to use double-sized clips. Once the pistol was upgraded, the player's backpack held clips with twice as many bullets, and those were represented by a clip model that was twice as long. But unfortunately, the longer clips presented a lot of distracting fictional problems. For one, they looked ridiculous protruding out of the bottom of the pistol. Players were also left wondering what was going on in their backpack to transform the single capacity clips that they put in there. Taking a look at the MSI upgrade stuff. Versions that they were pulling out. We were also left with the sort of absurd implication that the pistol clips found in the world now magically all had to be the upgraded double-sized versions. And while we did scrap the double-sized clips, the concept was still enticing. We just needed to well, we still have this. Metaphor. So then we started looking at the hoppers that were used on paintball guns that could store large amounts of paintballs. In fact, the final upgrade that resulted from this whole line of thinking is still internally referred to as the bullet hopper. So with this in mind, we next needed to design an intuitive interaction model. Players were already satisfied with our existing pistol interaction loop, which was eject clip, insert the next one. It is a really satisfying thing. Shoot. So we wanted to preserve these skills that players were already beginning to master. So players would still reload the gun as before, but small mechanical prongs would steal bullets from the inserted clip, pull them into the hopper, mm. and then place them into the firing chamber as needed. Audio cues were also added to clearly communicate the state of the hopper loading process. The hopper also impacted the visual design that we used to convey the state of the pistol. Originally, the clips themselves had a numerical counter indicating the number of bullets remaining. And on its own, this was fine. Mm. Players understood it easily. But the readout on the bullet hopper was on the opposite side of the pistol and had a pattern of blue dots indicating the amount of bullets remaining. So these two representations in two different locations made it difficult for players to quickly determine the total number of bullets in the upgraded gun. To solve this, we designed a single visual readout on the side of the pistol grip. Yeah, I think it this is a, a good way to do it. The pistol clip, the pistol's bullet chamber, and the bullet hopper if the upgrade was acquired. I kind of wish it was on this side, but that might like block some other stuff. I don't know. <clears throat> but yeah, also I'm using the AV1 encoder on my 4090 to encode it. I will say I had a bitch and a half trying to get it set up because I, I kind of fucked around and was changing some settings in the Oculus software and then that fucked it all up. So it, this is a little rant, by the way, you can just get past it. But <clears throat> um, I, I fucked it all up somehow. And when I loaded in to the Oculus software, it was all fucked up. Like it was all glitchy and things were popping in, and I, and I tried to change it back, but it seemed to not really work. So then I just uh, I looked at ways, and I just ended up going with virtual desktop, which wasn't so bad. But I have a big problem with the audio, where it keeps trying to switch to virtual desktop, even though I keep saying don't allow. I guess Windows like virtual desktop just overrides it and keeps allowing. So I just hopefully it doesn't do that again while I'm recording, but. <clears throat> We'll see, but with that, I was able to go up to 120 hertz instead of 90, like an Oculus software. I don't know if it's actually hitting 120 or if it's like locked to 90 because the Oculus, I, I don't really know. <clears throat> but yeah, there's that and um, 
Like, it says I'm getting around 120, I think. Yeah, like, it says that in MSI Afterburner, but I don't know if it actually is or not. It probably is. <clears throat> and, uh, I, like I said, I'm using the AV1 encoder, and it looks amazing. I do want to say that on my 4090, so... Oh, shit. Not more combine. Dear God. Dear Lord. Help me. Ooh. I'm getting some stutters, but it's VR. I expect to have some issues. There's a vent. Oh, I don't think there's a way I can get there from here. How do I? Oh, through there, probably. Okay, that makes more sense. <clears throat> oh, gosh. <clears throat> and I'm charging my headset, so. Oh, my God, I touched my green screen. I should get the shit out of myself. <laughs> Ah, uh, this is where you gotta go. Let me make sure I don't hit nothing. Cool. Russ, how's Dad doing? Does he seem okay? I feel oh, super he's tall, by the way. He's working away over there. Good. Well, thanks. Oh, he is missing a leg, though. Yeah. You know, he was missing a leg before. Right. Well, it's, it's still gone. Thanks, Russ. Sure thing. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, like, I'm extraordinarily tall. I think it's because in the Oculus software, I have my floor set up kind of high. But I'll just roll with it for now. I'll change it if it, like, gets unbearable. Oh, was he going for that? But I'll take it. Yeah, like I feel like, oh, there we go. Now I feel normal height. I just had to crouch and uncrouch and that fixed it. Oh, I have to hold it. What the fuck? Why is the finger going down? There we go. I don't remember what difficulty I'm playing on. Shit, hit my my desk. Get out of here. Out of the fucking way with you. Yeah. Good worth it. <laughs> I kind of wish it would close itself too, but oh well. Okay. Let me climb up here and see what's up there. If my aim wasn't shit. That though, thank you. That's where I'm supposed to be, I think. Kill this, see what it gives me. 
Ooh, that was worth it. <laughs> See, this shit looks amazing though. It's been a while since I played it, so I don't really remember if it looks way better or if it just looks about the same as last time. Well, I think last time I played it, I think it was with my 4090. I don't remember if I, last time I played this, it was with my 4090 or my 3080. I think it was with my 4090, but I don't really remember. Yeah. That's probably like a way back around. Oh, oh shit. Are you seeing that? The Vortigons are taking down the fucking lake. Yes. Nice. Oh, Jesus. Also, I don't know if you could tell, but I'm playing with a Quest 30 now, so it's the picture's much crisper. I don't, I don't know if that's a word, but much more crisp for me. I don't know if it looks different for y'all, but for me, it looks more crisp. <clears throat> um, also, I tried looking up ways that, because my Bluetooth earphones that I'm using, they have uh, like a delay, and I tried looking it up, and According to, I just looked at some forums and stuff, and it said that it's like that's normal, but the only real way to get around it is to like buy some that have low latency, which, like I, I said earlier, I did, but they sound like absolute shit. So um, I'm not using those. I'll, I'll just deal with the delay if it means not having to deal with absolute shit audio. Because, like I said, I couldn't even, the audio was so bad, I couldn't even tell if they had a delay or not, because I just did some test gameplay in like Apex and Overwatch too to see and I just straight up couldn't tell because the audio was so shit and I got sick of using them so there's that but I might try and buy some others that have like low latency maybe some over the head headphones maybe those would be better but I, I really don't like those that's why you never see me wear them <clears throat> I generally prefer um, earbuds I wouldn't be super opposed to wearing some earphones. Come here. Also, pretty soon I'll probably have more room to actually move around in VR without worrying about all this shit. Okay, yeah, this just leads me back around. Oh, that's really shaky. I'm a little concerned at where the combine is because I heard some earlier, but I don't know where they're at. Nothing there. Which is why I'm getting out this gun just in case. <clears throat> Oh, I think I can hear the... I think that's the combine that I'm hearing right now. That, like, machine sound. I'm guessing that's one of their gunners. <laughs> I'm also hoping this footage doesn't come out laggy because I can't really see it. So I'm just going to hope it's not lagging or anything. Because <clears throat> I'm using the AV1 encoder to encode, like, the VR, but I'm using my CPU encoder to do the, the footage, so I'm hoping it doesn't affect it at all. <laughs> But it very well might, I'm not sure. Hmm. Suppressor introduction. It's generally a requirement that all new enemy types have a section of the game designed... Oh, I saw him down there too. We rarely build the introduction early on in the process though, because it's often through playtesting that we learn exactly what aspects of the new enemy need to be highlighted in the introduction. In addition to understanding the capabilities of a new enemy, we also find introductions help solidify the very existence of the new enemy type in the player's mind. Without an explicit oh, yeah. introduction, we sometimes I don't doubt find that, that playtesters confuse multiple enemy types, conflating them in their minds. This was the case with the Suppressor, the class of soldier that's designed to pin a player behind cover while other soldiers advance on them. I remember the Suppressor them. is an inversion of the previous soldier classes, who've all focused on trying to push players out of cover. 
The suppressor introduction stretches across the next two rooms. In the first, players see the suppressor firing at zombies, giving the player a moment to safely observe its firing behavior. They also get to hear its associated sounds, which are important to learn for future encounters. In the oh, second yeah. room, players learn to fight the suppressor themselves. This is relatively straightforward when the suppressor is alone, but will become more involved in later arenas where we combine the suppressor with other soldier types. Yeah. The suppressor, I didn't know that's what they were called, but I don't remember. I remember them not being too difficult because you literally just hide. They have quite a long, like, telegraph before they shoot. The shotgun dudes are the worst to me. I was hoping he'd walk this way so I could hit him with the explosive barrel, but he did not. There ain't nothing in there, damn it. Wasting my fucking time game. <laughs> but yeah, pretty soon I might have, I'll probably have a lot more room to uh, actually play VR without hitting shit and still use my green screen and stuff. But it just depends. Okay. Oh, fuck. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Oof. Okay. I'm trying to stay in front of the webcam, but uh, like I said, you might see me wander off. Depends. Depends really on how much I move. Hang on, did I miss anything over here? I don't see anything. Yeah, just want to make sure. Oh fuck, I just ran my hand across the keyboard. <laughs> Can I open these? No. Damn. Ooh. I don't remember if I get any more weapons than the ones I have now. I don't think I do, because it seems like these are four slots, and I don't think it's going to go like eight or anything. And I don't remember any other weapons in these, so I, I think these are all the weapons I'm going to get. Nothing on your body. Nothing. Oh. Kind of weird seeing it poke around like that. <laughs> Are these like different levels of something? Yeah, it looks like kind of like sound waves. If you've seen those in like, I don't know, editing software or whatever, or mixing software, it's <laughs> kind of what it reminds me of. Okay, there's no direct path from where you are to the vault, so you're going to have to stank your way there. Well, huge, so it shouldn't be hard to know which way I'm going. <laughs> I don't understand what they're doing with it here. If this weapon is so powerful, why keep it locked up in a dump like this? My guess is they're trying to find a way to ship it off Earth, back to their home on some other planet. Why not use it here? They already won this war, Alex. Yeah, they already, like, destroyed this planet, and there's there's some resistance, but I, I don't think it's worth, like, using a massive weapon on us, probably. 
probably a lot of resources. It isn't practical to spend development time or art resources evenly across every part of the game, so we rely on strategic reuse of resources to maintain fidelity and specificity across the game's environments. This space was initially constructed using industrial models and textures seen throughout many previous environments. To set it apart, we added the large cables and vortigaunt pods to imply a makeshift combine power plant whose purpose was to transmit energy to the substations. Oh, the juxtaposition of this of abandoned it's industrial like space lab with large they... combine cables created enough visual interest to make the space feel meaningful at a relatively low cost. The cable motif was subsequently hmm. added to other parts of the game to increase visual interest and give the player a sense of being led toward the vault. It may not be obvious, but the cables yeah. exiting through the ceiling here continue on to the exterior of the building, across the large construction courtyard, and over the roof of the distillery building, back my head, presumably just... continuing on to a substation or other combine infrastructure. Players may not notice that continuation, yeah. but such details help guide us in building a world that feels connected and consistent. I forgot that I could do that till now. <laughs> the double hand, like I can hold it. Oh, fuck. Okay, well, I just walked right into that. I legit did not see it until right when I got up. <laughs> like, I saw it right as I was walking up in front of it. And by then, it was too late. <laughs> Oh, yes. More stuff. More stuff. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't think there's anything else I really care too much to upgrade, but I have the option to now. <clears throat> oh, yeah, one of these. Fuck. Not good at these. As long as I don't touch it, it's like not considered active. I remember that from last time. Where if you don't touch the thing, it won't. Into you. Ooh. One of the few times I actually needed some health. <laughs> yeah, okay, I can go backwards there, but I don't need to. Yes. Anything under here? No. Yeah, a bunch of dead combine and zombies. Made a lot of things. Oh, damn, you got fucked up. Jesus Christ, man. Look at that. Might be my thumbnail. Ugh. <laughs> Look at, like, the torn jacket and shit. That's pretty cool. Ugh. And the 50 foot long fingers. There's something over here. No. Guessing that I'm guessing that was just there to fuck with me. <clears throat> yeah. have a ton of shotgun ammo left so let me not just waste all that
There we go. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, those are the tank ones, but in this game, I don't think they really do that much in this game, so I'm not super worried about them. Yeah, I still have a decent chunk of ammo for that. Oops. Not much, but saves me a little bit of ammo. Jesus. Yeah, I'll just waste that bullet and... Because that's a gun I can't just, like, reload any time I want. I can only reload it. I'm pretty sure I can only reload it when it's... But it needs to be reloaded. No! There we go. Yeah, uh, this went too far. <laughs> Oops. Please explode. Yes, okay. Wasn't sure if that would explode on its own or I'd do something to it. Actually, it would have been better if I let it over here and let it get eaten or something. That would have saved me some ammo. But that's okay. Shit happens. I get in there. Oh, from the top, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let's bring this explosive here. I'm getting some stutters like right there. I got a stutter. I don't know if you guys can tell, but <clears throat> but it is VR, and like I said, I know VR is quite a bit more taxing than a lot of other stuff. Oh gosh, he's got a fucking hammer in his ear. Jesus Christ. Not surprising, but still. Still something else. Ooh. Yes. Nothing in there. Was even looking for that, but I'll take it. What is this? He still didn't kill you. To one. My last, my last thing I'm out for this. And they got nothing for me in here either, I don't think. Oh. I'll take that. Could use some more pistol ammo, but like I said, I'll take this. The machine can ammo too. Let me save. Or I forget. Two dumbasses. That's shell.
bring this with me. I think I remember this area. I think this area has like a lot of combine coming up, I think. It looks familiar. And it does make me just a little bit worried. Come here, you. Right. Oh, AI and VR. One problem we faced with the VR movement styles that Alex supported was keeping the combat experience from diverging based upon whether players were using teleport or continuous movement. If the combat oh, was yeah, significantly being a different challenge. depending on the player's movement setting, our playtesting requirements could explode combinatorially. One way that we prevented this combinatorial is by ensuring Never that AI could sense player movement no matter which locomotion style the player was using. To do this, we created a visual proxy for players using teleport locomotion. Imagine a scenario where the player is behind cover hidden from a soldier's sight. If the player used continuous movement to run to another piece of nearby cover, the soldier would see them while they were out in the open. But a player who instantly teleported from one piece of cover to the next would not be seen. To solve this discrepancy, when a player teleports, we leave a breadcrumb trail of invisible visual proxies, which the enemy AI can see. These proxies pass information to the AI, similar to what it would have gathered from seeing the player perform the movement directly. In this case, the soldier would know the teleporting player had left the original cover and run across open ground to the new cover, just like a player using continuous motion. While obviously not identical, in that the soldier didn't have a chance to take a shot at the teleporting player, these kinds of features did allow us to reduce the number of ways our AI logic needed to take player movement options into consideration. So just less work on the system, I guess. But yeah, this, I think this scenario I got like, I died quite a few times on before, I think. So let me, oof. I did not see him. Yeah, damn. Alex? I did not see Alex, him up still there. there. Okay. Anyways. Yeah, I just, wow. He definitely suppressed my ass. For sure. I think he died. Oh, yes. Uh, 
Oof. Need to thin in these lockers. I'm actually lagging kind of hard in this room. Seems okay now. But for a bit there, I was like, actually kind of lagging. <clears throat> oh yeah, the fucking... There we go. The HUD pops up. Okay, shit. I'll go ahead and save it here, because I still have another save, I think, before. It's going to be a bit of a break. I know there's more, though, coming up. <clears throat> I thought they were all going to show up at once, but no, give me a break here. Out of shells. Please. I thought they would have shown up like right as I walked down these stairs, but no, it's giving me a little bit more time. Thank fuck for that. Oh. Oh, nice. It's hoping for more ammo, but I'll take the resin. There we go. It's a lot of cover. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, well, it didn't let me uh, pull it off his body, but I had, <clears throat> he did have more ammo. This, yeah, I have quite a bit of ammo for this. So I'll use this to deal with whoever else shows up. I guess, fuck it, I'll save real quick then, <laughs> since I have all this ammo and shit. saves. Oof. <laughs> Goddamn. Yeah, I should have backed off. So that's all that. I'll pull out the grenade next time. I still have a grenade. Yeah.
Okay. Whew. Wasted a shell on this dude, but I'd say it was worth it just to be safe. And the, the menu again. So yeah, I don't think you got anything on you. Fucking bum. Not carrying shit for me. God damn it. Hitting my fucking desk. I don't see anything in there anyways. Definitely take that, thank you. my like scratch my arm and my my charging cord oh, what the fuck was that noise I don't know but it scares the shit out of me just seeing if I can grab anything but no oh my god Ooh. yes please <coughs> He just kicked me right in my fucking dome. Soundscapes. For Half-Life Alex, we wanted to expand the functionality of our soundscape system, which is used to play- This sounds like an AI voice. In prior games, we could generally only play one soundscape at a time. Apparently it's David the Feast player would Feist. be hearing either soundscape A <clears throat> or soundscape B, with a brief crossfade from one to the other. In this game, the soundscapes are much more flexible and can be overlapped in ways that enable more realistic this. transitions. For example, the volume of different soundscapes can be controlled by the player's position and the open or closed state of particular doors in the world. We frequently use this functionality in areas like this transition between indoor and outdoor spaces. If you pause outside for a moment, you'll notice the crickets, birds, distant dog barks, and other environmental sounds that help paint the picture of the quarantine zone late in the day. Mm. As you move into the indoor area, you'll notice the outdoor soundscape diminish as you move away from the door. In fact, if you close the door, the volume of the outdoor soundscape is reduced even further. And as you progress into the building, you'll begin to notice the indoor soundscape consisting of the indistinct hum of machinery and buzz of electrical fixtures. So if I pause, Maybe he meant pause and like stop moving. Not pause like the actual game. I don't know. Oh yeah, like it just changed right there. <laughs> Dumbass. Save me some bullets. Yes. Okay. I don't see anything else up there. There's a hole right there. Someone's going to crawl through it. <laughs> I'm sure. Ooh. Oh, maybe I have to crawl through it. Maybe I just can't. Oh. Or you know I can do this. That works too, I guess. Sometimes you have to do a bit of thinking. Something I don't do very often. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, I thought I had the multi-tool. <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, I remember these. I want to grab that resin, but I'm pretty sure that will set off the mine. There we go. Nice. Is this another mine area? I remember... Oh, shit. I didn't even see those. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I remember there being, like, a second area where you have to deal with a bunch of mines. And this is probably it. Let me go ahead and save before I head down there. Shit. Hit my fucking desk again. Yep. completely missed that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. It actually is kind of stressful, though. Got the top one first. Progress, Alex. Progress. There's still more mines over there. Yeah, I don't have a grenade anymore, so carry this. Oh, no, let me not grab that. <laughs> right there because it might fly right up into it. God, I'm getting sloppy. Oh, there's a bunch of resin under there. Hold the fuck up. In right there. Oh, didn't even see this. Two shells left. That's what I'm talking about. Are you fucking kidding me? Why did that go to, like to the left, like that? Come on now. Oh shit. Some intense ass music playing too, but this is actually like an intense situation. Twenty, okay. Nice. Thank you. Ooh, yes. Wait, is that something else? Oh no, that's a mine, I think. Yeah, like that right there. I think that's just a mine. Go ahead and save that. Oh shit, hit my PC. <laughs> God. Oh, those are those things. Okay. It's like, what the fuck is that? Obviously, they're like zombies or whatever the fuck, but wasn't 100% sure. I'm going to save here before I kill these things. So I'm gonna kill them, but I want to see what they're gonna give me. I 
Devil gave me nothing. And I can't grab that. Yeah, maybe I won't kill them. Because that's a lot of... A lot of ammo shit. I remember this area. This area, there's like a lot of guys that are gonna show up. I gotta take out this dude. Yeah, I can't be having those drones out. Big bitch. Ouch. A little greedy there. There we go. a way into this building, so I'm gonna look around. What is this place anyway? It's a distillery. I spend the guess I, I thought. Vodka and things like that. Is vodka good? Oh god no. Oh. Russell doesn't like vodka. Got it. Well I I never said that. But it's not good? It's poison. But <laughs> but I love it. Everyone everyone loves it. Okay, that's all very confusing. Let me figure out how to get in and then I'll find you some. Wonderful if you if you could actually yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Oh, I think it needs to be powered on. Probably. But I assume it is at least. You take a look. Okay, my PC seems to There we go. Whew. Fuck yeah. and save here. <laughs> hmm. 
Okay, let me take a look around. What you got for me? Nothing in these. But I do see an open stall. I saw that j literally just spawn in. <laughs> I saw that game. And it broke on my head. It's okay, Alex has the fucking head of a... I don't know, a tractor, so I, I don't know. The Tin Man. Excuse me, while I look around literal shit. For shit. Take a look up here real quick. Wow, that was laggy as fuck right there. Jesus. Nothing on you. Nothing on you. Fucking bum. these fuckers on there. <laughs> now I can use a pistol. Bitch. Ran away like a bitch. What's in here? Okay. There's a healing thing over there, but I already have one that I put in there. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I want to look up to see if someone beat this game without killing anybody. I don't even know if it's possible, but there's all, like, I watch a lot of those. There's a lot of challenges where people try that, and it's always fun to watch. People try to beat a game, like, without killing anybody or something like that. I always enjoy that type of shit. I thought I'd drop the shell for a second. Oh, there's a lock, too. I was like, what the fuck is stopping me this time? Boom. Gotcha. I done gotcha. I don't know how far I'll keep going till, but... Yeah. I can... This time, too, I have my... I don't know if you can see it, but I have my... I think I said it earlier. My one of my portable chargers plugged into my headset, so this headset can go a lot longer. I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that the Quest Two's Quest Three, which is what I'm using, battery is pretty low. Like not as good as the Quest Two, apparently. Like I said, I, I haven't. I don't really because I have this. I can just always have it plugged in now, so it'll last for quite some time when I'm playing. Yeah, just let it go. Okay. Yeah, like I said, whenever I let it go, it just solves itself, basically. It, it lets me go. And I'll get that in a second, but... Oh, I think I need to turn the power. Back. I, got the train oh, cool. up and running again. I was about to shoot that shit. Oh, nice! I remember this shit got destroyed. We'll <laughs> it looks as if there are combined barricades up ahead. They're stopping anyone from getting any closer to the vault. Okay, 
stressful. Oh. Right. Might as well heal up a bit. Come on. It was harsh. All right, yeah. Where did auto save hats? Let's pay attention. Okay, right after I killed him. Good. Nothing on you. Damn it. Okay, well, let me listen to this first. Ladders. To our teleport and continuous locomotion modes, we provide corresponding ladder climbing methods. By default, player using teleport locomotion can target a ladder and after a short timer, get teleported to the top or the bottom, depending on where they started. The timer was necessary to ensure that players were intentionally using the ladder. We didn't want them to unintentionally target the ladder and become disoriented mm -hmm. when they found themselves at the other hand. Players using continuous that still happens to me sometimes. can directly grab ladders to climb up or down. In this mode, they can grab a ladder wrong and move their hand down to raise their body or move their hand up to lower it. This allows players to move up or down the ladder wrong by wrong in a natural way. This mode turned out to be so popular that we added it as an option even for players using teleport locomotion. As it happens, most of the ladders in our game do not extend very far beyond the upper landing area. This made dismounting the top of a ladder challenging for players using continuous ladder yeah, climbing. Yeah, I don't think I've ever actually done this before in this game. Onto above the landing area. To solve this, we detect when the player stop holding the ladder with both hands and automatically teleport them to either the top or the bottom based on the direction they are climbing. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of explicit ladder training in the game. So some players are surprised by this teleport behavior if they accidentally let go with both hands while climbing. Nevertheless, this was a better alternative to leaving oh, really? the players hanging or forcing them to fall down if they let go with both hands especially since some of our ladders are rather long and it would be tedious to have to reclimb just because a player happened to let go shortly before reaching the top. Yeah, I can see that. Like, if I let go... Okay, yeah, just... Oh, teleports me up. There we go.
me safe here since I already watched, listened to that. Oh, he just shredded Alex? me, Jesus. Alex! <clears throat> yeah, he just like completely obliterated me. My god. Alright. I just realized I didn't have this strap on. <laughs> this controller strap on. I don't like. I'm not tightening it, but. Better to have it on and stuff. anymore. Hopefully that's it. <laughs> okay. I think I'm good. Oof. Well, that was kind of rough, but I got through it. No ammo, no nothing. <clears throat> oh, yes, please. Man, I can see why y'all went to combine. Y'all some fucking thumbs. Ain't got nothing for me. Oh, yeah, let me go activate that. See if there's anything in here that I want. Or to upgrade. <laughs> mm. I see. So those three. There we go. Easy peasy. We shall go. What did I put on that? Oh, just a reflex site. Yeah. Nothing but a laser site. Oh, I would like a grenade launcher. <clears throat> I'll probably save it for that. It costs 40, though. Jesus. Let me save before I do this, just in case. Oh, it's fucking... Showing the HUD again. I just don't like the HUD there, because it kind of gets in the way when I'm trying to get thumbnails.
this thing, I still need to do something in there. Let's get this shit figured out. Oh, yeah, this, oh shit, I hit my, oh, I didn't even realize I was facing my green screen. Let me turn away. Y'all getting a shot of my bodacious buns for free. Can't be having that now. Combine. No, oh, okay. Hopefully. <laughs> No, still not working. Let me see where this leads, the shallow wire. I don't know if this is the same way or not, but I'm going to assume it is. Yeah, it just leaves there. No! Oh, wow, I didn't die from that somehow. <laughs> I'm sure someone in real life could survive that too, with probably little to no injury. Probably. I'm not seeing anything there. Shit around here. Yeah. Get out of here. There we go. Damn it. Get the fuck out of here. Nappy little fuckers. Oh. Pissing my green screen again. <laughs> There we go. Okay, yeah, now I gotta go up top. Oh, there we go, just barely made that. <laughs> hmm. Let's go ahead and save here too. loading screen. My battery's at 69. Nice. I don't think you guys can see this because I'm in the Oculus menu right now, but... <laughs> There's definitely a bunch of old bottles in here. Oh, is this where Jeff's gonna be? It only improves. It's all good, Alex. 
Russell, you're breaking up. The vodka is coming in now. The vodka is coming up. Yeah, this is going to be the Jeff section. I'll probably play through this and I'll probably stop. Some of our earliest experiments on the project involved placing old Half-Life 2 models in a level and walking around them in VR. These included static models of enemies, like combine soldiers or zombies. We found that players really enjoyed being able to inspect these models because VR let them get much closer than they'd been able to in the past. Players it's reported pretty getting cool. a sense of the true size of the characters and would often point out details that they had never noticed before, even though they had seen these models many times throughout Half-Life 2. Eagles. These reactions led us to the idea of creating an enemy that took advantage of that experience, one that required players to spend long periods of time in close physical proximity to it. But enemies typically don't let the player get near them without attacking, so we felt it made fictional sense for this enemy to be blind and to feature non-combat game play as its focus. On I didn't need you play as its focus. Oh, Early experiments with guiding a blind creature using sounds were immediately interesting and gave us a way to create scenarios unique to the product. Thus, the concept for Jeff, known as the blind zombie internally, was born. Yeah, Jeff's one of my favorite levels in the game. Like, this shit's a ton of fun. I don't have a gas mask like I did. I tried to wear one the whole time, but it looks like they took it off. But I do remember finding that out the first time I played that if you wear a gas mask, it will stop you from coughing. And you don't have to cover your mouth anymore. Yeah, because like you have to cover your mouth here. Send ears. The Zen flora you see on the wall here stop yourself from which coughing we refer to, to alert Jeff. Ears for obvious reasons. Animate in reaction to the same sounds as Jeff. Early in development, we would observe situations where playtesters would fail to notice Jeff becoming enraged by a sound. If the player died as a result, they felt frustrated and wronged. We worked to make Jeff's animations and sounds communicate his level of aggression to the player as clearly as possible. But if players weren't looking at Jeff, they could still be caught unaware. Adding these senior growths to the environment was a way for us to help players be more aware of Jeff's reactions to sound. The Zen years work as an extra layer of visual feedback for Jeff's behavioral state, one that lives in the environment instead of on Jeff himself. Just shot glasses and a fucking head grab. I do want to say that the Quest 3 has been really nice because it's lighter, it's smaller. I actually don't know if it's lighter, but it seems like it's lighter. It's definitely smaller. And then I also bought a head strap with it immediately, so I haven't even used the strap it came with. But it seems to not be that much better, if at all, than the... ...than the Quest 2 strap from what people have said. But like I said, I, I just immediately bought this strap with it that I'm wearing now, so... I haven't even tested it. With that. Okay, that's full. Come here. There we go. Yeah, like I said, I'll stay about 40 so I can get that grenade launcher. Ooh, it's like really nice out here. Alex, Look come in, Alex. Birds. Alex, I'm here. Well, oh, there you are. There you are. There's no straight shot to the vault. I'm gonna head inside and find a way out. Jesus. Same claims. You're never gonna believe. Russ? Oh god. Oh fuck, I hit my knee on my stool. <laughs> Jesus. Alright. Right from the beginning of development, we intended to feature a variety of visually distinct Zen flora and fauna in Half-Life Alex. But we didn't yet know how these visual elements would be used to craft interesting gameplay. Referred to internally as Zen clams, 
The Zen plants you would see here were originally built to add visual flavor to the world and were only lightly interactive. Yeah. They would attract the player's head and hands and would close tight if the player got too close. When we began working on Jeff, we wanted to find surprising new ways to use sound as a core gameplay mechanic. In particular, we wanted to make players wary of the environment around them. We realized we could use the Zen clams as a type of noise hazard by they having them repeatedly snap Maybe open and enough. shut when approached by the player. It we is kind of satisfying sound. We these clams in earlier parts of the game, <laughs> which meant that players would reach the distillery with an understanding of how they functioned. The introduction of Jeff changed the player's relationship with the Zen clams, as they went from being harmless but annoying to a dangerous hazard that players would need to take care to avoid. Interesting. Uh, with the blood on you. You, with the blood. <laughs> hey, uh, Larry, is that your name? Situation here? Yeah, you sure do. <laughs> you, uh, you don't have to have a gun on you, do you? No, I, I don't. Yeah, look at that. It's a <laughs> nice one, too. It's nicer than mine, which is up inside this guy. Oh, that sucks for you. That is unfortunate. Oh, man. <laughs> You keep your tongue to yourself, and I don't shoot you in it. <laughs> Thanks. There's Jeff. What the hell was that? Oh, that's Jeff. Jeff? Oh, don't worry. You can't see. Ears. Just got an ear like Mozart. Who? All right. Now let me help. She doesn't know who Mozart is. <laughs> All right. See you on the other side, Greenhorn. And keep your voice down. Jesus. I remember uh, one thing I forgot to say earlier is when she was talking about the vodka, that I remember, I think that that was about the time in my first playthrough of this game that I was like, wow, how young is she? Um, yeah, I think that she's 19 in this game, I think. And I think in Half-Life 2, she's 25, if I remember correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but... Early versions of the distillery explored a variety of methods for subtlety, teaching players how Jeff works without any yeah. explicit exposition. Though some of the training techniques were quite successful, Anything less than a complete understanding of Jeff's behavior resulted in players bungling their way through this section of the game and having a terrible time doing it. Eventually, see that. we determined that explicit training was necessary, and that's where the character of Larry came in. Larry acts as a gate, delivering critical information about Jeff's behavior yeah, they before mentioned allowing gates the before. player to proceed. It's a dense learning environment and a delicate balancing act, ensuring that we deliver the rules of Jeff while still making Larry an interesting character. To spread out the exposition, you'll notice that it's distributed over a few different story beats as Larry first introduces Jeff, then demonstrates Jeff's predictable reaction to a breaking bottle, and finally explains that the player can prevent their own coughing on Zen spores by covering their mouth. Interesting. Yeah, the covering the mouth thing is the main thing I remember, and then using a gas mask to stop that from happening. I don't know if there's a way to kill Jeff, like if he just takes a fuck ton of ammo, or if he just straight up can't kill him. I'm guessing he's unkillable. But yeah. I remember in this episode of, of my first playthrough of the game, it sucked because I, I accidentally muted the audio, and I didn't realize it. It, it kind of fit the theme of the episode, so it was like, oh, I could play it off like that, but man, that fucking sucked. I lost the, the gameplay. I, I still have my microphone audio, but... but not the uh, game audio, unfortunately. Hey, hey, 
Those things are nasty. You gotta cover your mouth. Got it. Thanks. Hey, I, I almost <laughs> forgot. What's your name? Alex. Alex. I'm Larry. Like, hey, Alex. I'm Larry. Nice to meet you. Try not to get killed. That's cool. It actually like was muffled when I covered my mouth. I can open this box. Thank you. 28. Uh, how much? <laughs> how many more do I need? What's 17? In order to get. Uh, was it. Did I need 45 to get the grenade launcher? No, it's 40, I think. So I need 12 more. The core element of both the environment and Jeff himself are the Zen plants seen here spewing toxic gas that makes the player cough. These were not created to be merely ornamental or to support the novel VR interaction of players covering their mouth. They were added specifically to solve a long-standing challenge that we had with illustrating Jeff's personal space. One of the trickier aspects of designing Jeff was striking the right balance between perceived threat and actual threat. Many scenarios in the level forced the player into close proximity with Jeff in order to create tension. We found that these moments could be exciting, but they could also become frustrating when players accidentally got too close to Jeff and were killed unexpectedly. Players reported not understanding how close is too close. We tried a number of solutions, such as adding glowing tentacles to Jeff that acted as a visual representation of the oh, of his personal space. Interesting. Touch the tentacles and you die. Getting the look and feel of these tentacles to a satisfactory place proved challenging, however, and we backed away from the idea. Another problem we encountered was that a subset of our players quickly became comfortable around Jeff once they became adept at keeping their distance from him and avoiding sources of noise. For these players, dealing with Jeff felt trivial. He simply didn't feel like a threat to them. We discussed a variety of potential solutions to these problems, even wacky concepts such as giving Jeff the ability to teleport to sources of noise. But it was difficult to oh come up with ideas that didn't feel like we were giving Jeff the ability to cheat. Eventually, we came yeah. up with the idea of having the player cough. This was appealing, as it gave us a way to make the player themselves a source of noise, thus causing Jeff to pursue them. We were also interested in making the environment more dangerous generally, and so our first experiments with coughing involved littering the level with zen plants spewing toxic gas. Initial tests showed a lot of promise. Players now felt like Jeff was a dangerous pursuer, and they must carefully observe the environment to avoid the gas. We observed that players had a natural instinct to cover their mouth with their hand to suppress their cough. This was an affordance that VR with tracked hand controllers supported very much, yeah, like, so we implemented this mechanic right away. This still left us with the problem of players being unsure of how close they could safely get to Jeff. We realized that the early experiment of adding tentacles to Jeff could be replaced with a much simpler approach of attaching a toxic cloud directly to him. There were multiple benefits to this. First, it gave players visual feedback for how far they needed to stay away from Jeff to be safe. Second, it made those times when Jeff did get close all the more tense, with players now needing to commit a hand to covering their mouth. Finally, yeah. they didn't need to teach the players anything new. They could carry forward what they had already learned about toxic gas in the environment and apply those lessons to Jeff himself. Yeah, that's interesting. To me, it still doesn't make him that big of a threat with the covering the mouth thing, but it is more of a challenge. for me no single controller mode one of our major goals in the design of half-life alex was to reach the widest possible audience this meant developing for all of the major vr hardware in the market as well as accommodating different sized play spaces traversal preferences and so on the accessibility option that had the most knock-on effects into the design of the game from controller bindings to game logic to level design was the support of a single controller mode for players who don't use two controllers. 
In this mode, reloading is performed <laughs> by moving the weapon to the shoulder and pressing a button, much like arcade oh. games which require the player to fire their weapon off yeah, screen. Yeah, kind of like I remember those as arcade games where you shoot off screen or over the shoulder. To attach to the primary hand and gas masks were added bring back so some players memories. Can muffle their coughs hands free. Even the gun used in the final Strider battle, with its two-handed aiming and reloading controls, was modified to be operable with one hand. Hmm. I didn't even know there was a one-handed thing. I guess there's all kinds of VR shit out there. Oops. Did I drop something? So you gotta accommodate all kinds of them. Just attack. As we refined Jeff's behavior and visual design, we thought a lot about how we wanted players to feel about him. The goal was to have playtesters describe Jeff with words such as menacing, threatening, and deadly. And for that reason, it became important that players not survive if they got too close to Jeff. So we decided that his attack should result in instant death. This would teach players unambiguously that Jeff was too dangerous to trifle with. But it Does left us still... the challenge of teaching this to players without necessarily killing them. The approach we took was to give the player opportunities to witness Jeff attack and kill other characters. Early versions of the level included scenarios where Jeff and the player would encounter zombies and combine soldiers. The player could attack hmm. these enemies, or use sound to lure Jeff into place so that he could pummel them with his massive arms. This that gave players an opportunity to witness Jeff's power and his method of attack without dying at his hands themselves. Unfortunately, this outcome wasn't guaranteed as some players would opt to kill those enemies themselves, and having these other characters present was also quite expensive in terms of animation, sound, and level content. I can see that we that's the main thing I can see. We were already the challenge of keeping this level well paced and within scope, and so we cut these sections. But this still left us with the original problem of how to demonstrate Jeff's ability to kill without killing the player. We chose to address this by adding beats to existing animated sequences. For example, when the player opens this two-handed roller door, we added a headcrab for Jeff to munch on in full view of the player. Mm. We also added a similar beat to the later elevator ride, with Jeff smashing a headcrab against the elevator wall ride, and I remember. melting it down with acid. Nice. I do wish they would have kept that combine thing, because that would have been great. Um, you could have had it maybe to where we're on one side and they're on the other, and Jeff, you know, goes and just slaughters them all. Even though Larry instructs the player on the basics of how Jeff works, we found that we needed to let players test those rules without having Jeff in their immediate personal space. If we made players first interact with Jeff face to face, they often fell to pieces and forgot the rules. They would die over and over again, and their fear the of Jeff would right quickly now. turn into frustration and annoyance. This area was created to serve as a training playground where players can observe Jeff reacting to various sounds while remaining safe from his attacks. It contains many of the elements that are encountered throughout the rest of the level, including some falling bottles, a padlock that needs to be shot, and various types of zen plants. Jeff remains close enough to feel threatening, but he cannot attack the player. Players can spend as much time here as they need to, yeah. and move on when they feel like they've got a good grip on how Jeff works. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Let's save here. All right, Jeff. Part of the game is actually kind of tense. J 
Jeff's design. Jeff's character design went through several significant revisions over the course of development. Just by looking at him, we wanted players to understand certain things about the character. Our first priority was to communicate his blindness. Second, we wanted the character to feel physically imposing. After all, the entire concept of Jeff had grown out of our observation that just being close to a character in VR could make for a powerful experience. Finally, we wanted players to understand the blind zombie's behavioural state at a glance. Is he feeling angry? Did he just hear something and is feeling curious? And so on. The first design that we modelled and animated was a sort of combine worker robot. The robot's face oh, featured a holographic robot. display that could flip between different icons that represented its state. A large piece of rebar jutted out of the back of the robot's head, sparking electricity and spewing smoke. This was meant to demonstrate that its visual sensors were impaired, making it blind. Interesting. We made the robot tall and hulking. It looked heavy, unpredictable and dangerous. However, player reactions to this robotic design showed that it had problems. Players would initially focus on the head's holographic display. Passing the face oh. and understanding the meaning of the icons <laughs> proved too challenging for players. And even worse, mm. this element distracted from the rebar poking through the robot's head and their understanding that it was blind. Players found the robot imposing, but we weren't getting the deeply visceral reaction of fear that was desired. Mm, I can see that. A trip back to the drawing board landed us with the more organic character you see in front of you. Drawing inspiration mm. from the idea of coal miners succumbing to the black lung, we focused on the concept of a member of the combined oh, that's Zen an interesting inspiration. that had succumbed to the Zen infection. This gave us the visceral reaction from players which we were looking for. A human face is still visible, but the eyes are clearly decayed. Oh, is it? I haven't really looked at him too close. The organic so. nature of this design allowed us to lean more heavily on audio to feed back the behavioral state, with animalistic grunts and roars that came to include more human sounding elements over time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember that, like a lot of this part from the first time I played, because it was just that good. It was really memorable to me. And I know I'm gonna have to let him out too. I remember, I don't know why, but I have to let him out. I think that there's like an electrical thing I have to solve. God. Yeah, of course. Your toner puzzle. Toner puzzles are a useful design tool since they force players to move around the environment and also occupy their primary hand via use of the multi tool. In this area, the player has to aim their flashlight to navigate, point their off hand to teleport, cover their mouth to prevent coughing, follow wires with the multi tool, and potentially pull bottles with their gravity gloves. The player has to make trade offs as they proceed since their two hands are overcommitted by design. One handed players are even more overwhelmed by these many tasks. This is why we littered the distillery with gas masks the player can attach to their mouth so they won't have to use a hand to muffle their cough. This toner yeah. puzzle went through several revisions, many of which left Jeff free to roam while players worked on the puzzle. But this resulted in players having to juggle too many elements at once, and their fear of Jeff quickly turned into frustration. The solution was to keep Jeff locked up while players solved the puzzle, with his distant roars maintaining a level of tension. We were then left with the problem of how to release Jeff so the level could continue. Initial ideas involved having Jeff break out from the freezer on his own when the puzzle was complete, but this felt contrived and scripted compared to having the player free Jeff from the freezer. Yeah, I think having us having to free him is better. Give us a logical solution to this problem, with the added benefit of creating a moment of high tension for the player when they realize they're going to have to open the freezer door and release Jeff in order to proceed.
Oh fuck. Puzzles are a useful design tool since they force. Over here, Jeff. Over that way. There you go. I didn't even crack, but it seems like you heard it. I want that resin. Many of our ideas for Jeff involved coming up with plausible ways to force Jeff and the player to occupy an enclosed space at the same time. An elevator ride was on the table from the beginning, but we were unsure of how successful it would be in execution. There was also a concern that such a sequence could be technically expensive to pull off. Our first prototype was extremely rudimentary. Players would get into an elevator with Jeff, the ride would last around 30 seconds, and then Jeff and the player oh, would that's exit. It? There was no complicated level scripting, no bespoke animations for Jeff, and no special audio or lighting treatment. Despite the relative lack of polish, players had a strong positive reaction to the sequence, even yeah, naming I mean, it a highlight of the game when we ran company-wide playtests. This what convinced I, to us me that it's it was worth putting more work into the elevator ride to make it something really special. In the end, a lot of different disciplines came together to create the final sequence, which combines sound, animation, scripted lighting, and careful choreography of Jeff's movements and the player's actions. Get up there. Oh, I don't. Oh, Jesus. This is a cool scene, though. Oh. 
Jesus Christ, man. Oh, there is a human face. I can see it now. Oh. Get that little fucker. Jesus Christ, man. Go on, Jeff. You first. <laughs> this shit was still going. Oh, that's one of the fucking legs. Most of the time, the noises that attract Jeff are created by the player, who is either actively trying to lure him to a new location, or has perhaps made a noisy mistake that could have been avoided. The key point being that the player feels some amount of responsibility for the noises being made. The goal of the upcoming hallway was to flip that idea on its head, if only for a moment. Like a misbehaving pet, this cheeky headcrab appears to surprise and infuriate the player, clumsily knocking over a series of bottles before escaping into a vent. Classic headcrab nonsense. We were surprised to find yeah. that many players wanted to check and see if the headcrab had indeed escaped. They would climb up onto the boxes <laughs> and crane their head up into the vents. This prompted the idea oh, wow. of adding a small easter egg to reward those players. Try it and you'll find that the cheeky crab has indeed escaped to be annoying another day. The cost of adding these sorts of secrets needs to be weighed against the potential for players to actually discover them. In this case, our playtest observations made the cost appear worth it in particular for the impact it would have in making the world feel more real. A full reality where living creatures go about their lives, even if the player isn't there to witness them. Yeah, I think that's something that's probably always hard to get right. Get out of here. Oh, fuck. There's some risen. Oh my god, dude. I'm like Game, can you not do this? It does that whenever like you're out of bounds, but like Jesus. Okay. This away. Oh, Christ. That scared me. I thought that was a live combine for a second. I was like, what? I don't remember there being any combine in this area. Alec, coming in. Hey, Alec. Right, I need three of oh, them. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? More or less. Breaking up. I think you're still in the distillery. I made a friend named Jeff. Well, that's great. We can take all the help we can get. Yeah, we're not really close. Listen, there should be a big tunnel-sized plug in the floor there somewhere. That's gonna be... The tunnel out of here? Correct. You get it open, I'll figure out where it leads. Okie dokie. Combine the four suits. Of Jeff yeah, four suits. Keeping Jeff and the player in close proximity to each other, the distillery map was constructed as a series of chambers connected by one-way transitions. Early on, we used two techniques in concert to keep Jeff and the player together throughout the level. First, each new area was gated with a special locked door. These took the form of impenetrable Zen membranes that only Jeff could tear through. The player would lure mm -hmm. Jeff to the membrane using sound, and Jeff would break it open so that both Jeff and the player could proceed. 
we had always had a goal of having players describe Jeff in adversarial terms, as a constant pursuer or a thorn in their side. The problem with his I didn't ring definitely see that. was that it led to players describing Jeff as a useful tool, or worse, an angry co-op partner, rather than something they feared. Another way that we would keep Jeff and the player together was via the use of one-way drops. Jeff would fall off catwalks, platforms, and ladders into each new area. These drops functioned as intended, <laughs> but just like the Zen membranes, elicited an undesirable reaction from players, especially when repeated multiple times. Watching Jeff do these pratfalls left players feeling like he was less dangerous. They felt sorry for him, and even laughed at him. Eventually, we realized that we could use combined force fields, which the player cannot pass through, as a way to create one-way doors. These force fields allowed Jeff to move through them, but required the player to follow via another one-way path. This allowed us to build thresholds where Jeff and the player could both move forward while eliminating the awkwardness of the Zen membranes and avoiding the repeated falls that had previously made Jeff look so clumsy. Combine force fields also had a few other benefits. For one, they gave Jeff a convenient way to take a backstage route that is inaccessible to the player, like the one at the bottom of this ladder. They also tied in nicely with Jeff's fictional background as a former member of the Combine Zen cleanup crew. Oh, that was just... <laughs> interesting. No one here, buddy. Here we go. Okay, yeah, just to make sure. Go ahead and save. Since I have the mask now. Just a health thing, I don't need that. <laughs> Is that what I picked up? I thought I picked up like one of the things. Oh, I did. It's just in there. Great. gas mask. Oh. Yeah, I, apparently I accidentally took off my gas mask. Oh, sure. Well. I do too. 
Which way are you gonna go, bitch? Creating an experience with such a heavy focus on audio presented some unique design problems. The primary challenge was determining which sounds Jeff should be able to hear and making sure that players understood the rules. Half-Life Alex contains a vast array of physics objects. However, through playtesting we found it best to use only a small set of them in the distillery. We needed to pay close attention to each object that we did include, particularly to audio design for collisions between the object and the various surface types used in the distillery. It was important that what players heard matched their expectations for how Jeff would react. In early testing, we would find individual cases where players would say things like, I don't know why Jeff got angry, or I would have expected that noise to attract Jeff. Over time, we identified these cases of confusion and addressed them one by one. It was vital that players always be able to identify the cause and effect of a noise that might attract Jeff. Failing this meant players were left this sound very like important. Jeff acted randomly and they'd grow frustrated. Some experiments failed in this area. At one point, parts of the level were littered with piles of broken glass that would make noise if the player walked or teleported over them. Few players would notice the broken glass and were then surprised when Jeff attacked, so this concept was cut to avoid confusion. We had to be wary of the opposite case too, where players would expect purely aesthetic elements to present a noise hazard. For example, at one point we had placed shallow pools of water seeping in among the floor tiles. It looked really cool, but it confused some of our playtesters who thought that the sound of their footsteps splashing through these puddles would be audible to oh. Jeff, even though we never intended that to be the case. It's interesting. Jeff. Uh, I don't need that. Okay. Jeffy boy. Oh, fuck. <laughs> but let's not go the exact way he's going. Way, big bitch. Which way? Oh, my PC again. here I don't see anything else in there there we go Whew. and that it's just that level so good 
Nicely done. And there we go. Okay, I still have that on. <laughs> How much resin do I have? 35. I need five more. If I can get that grenade launcher. <clears throat> I know he shows up up here. Yep. What the hell is that? That's Jack. Keep your voice down. Oh, okay. I can't wait Just death. That's right, go on, bitch. Get your ass up in there. That's your coffin, by the way. Ooh. I remember I locked him in here before, but I didn't actually press the button and kill him because I didn't realize you could do that <laughs> until I watched videos. Well, I did do that, but only after I was watching videos up to that point, and then I, I think I did it. Bye bye. Bye bye, Jeff. You're probably my favorite part of the game, but bye bye. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my God, Jeff. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, Alex. <laughs> the way she just laughed about that shit. Jesus. Figuring out how to end the player's journey through the distillery involved a lot of discussion about how players would ultimately end up feeling about Jeff. Observing playtests told us that most players simply... Oh, that's how he got in here. Usually from the moment they met him, but there were some who felt kind of sorry for him and didn't necessarily want to see him killed. Our first version of the ending involved the player's actions unintentionally resulting in Jeff being attacked and dragged away by ant lions. Part of the goal was to demonstrate that the ant lions are even more powerful than Jeff, to amp up the tension just before players have to square off against ant lions themselves. This ending left players feeling a little empty. There are ant lions in this they game? They felt detached from Jeff's demise and wanted that. to be more directly involved. Dark stuff, to be sure. Plus, we weren't really servicing those players who felt sorry for Jeff and didn't necessarily want to see him killed. There were other problems, too. The ant lion attack felt random to many players, which reduced its impact. And because Jeff presumably died off screen, players were left without a sense of closure. This mm -hmm. prevented players from being able to switch gears and settle in for their encounter with the ant lions. The trash compactor was a solution to these problems. It gave players the opportunity to decide Jeff's fate and be left with a sense of yeah, closure. Yeah, like I didn't even know you could kill him. Squash him in my first playthrough until I watched videos, and I think when even I came so, back, I did. It has to be admitted that most players seem to crush Jeff with zero hesitation. Monsters. <laughs> Monsters. I agree with you. Jeff is an angel. Jeff's the oh, angel what of death. Did you do to Jeff? Yeah. Oh, I hey, what's up, bro? Trash compactor, and then I crushed him. Oh, <laughs> well, I, uh, I hope you came across some of the good stuff. See you around. Okay, the coast is clear. See you, bro. Time to get that plug open so we can get through those tunnels. Come on. There we go. There we go. Oh my god. Good news. That tunnel heads to the vault. Great. Also, a little heads up. I think the tunnel is full of ant lines. Just in case I cut out permanently. Ant lions, ant lions, oh, I ant see the lions. lights for ant lions. Yeah, you know, aliens with stabby legs. 
Oh, yes, uh, and very small, like ants. No. no. I like tiny little lions. No, that's not them. These ones are pretty dangerous. Right, uh, well, whatever they are, they're down that tunnel. Yep, off I go. <laughs> Alex, you are much braver than me. Just need one more resin. But this is actually where I'm going to go ahead and end the episode. Yeah. Ooh, okay, thank you guys so much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. That was a ton of fun. It's been a while since I've actually just sat down and recorded because I've been streaming more recently on YouTube. But uh, actually sitting down and recording and especially some VR gameplay, it's been a lot of fun. Um, the Jeff section is probably my favorite in the game. It's between that, the bomb sections... And then the final section probably where like you actually make it up to the vault and you just wreck shit up there um those three are my favorite but jeff i, I just love the jeff section uh, it's a ton of fun to me and even on my second playthrough still a ton of fun i knew i actually knew what to do this time so it wasn't as big a deal but oh you missed it well i might keep it in but i actually have like a line in my hair um, you can see the fucking line <laughs> through my hair from the headset through it, but I'm, I'm redoing my outro and you may or may not see my fucking goofy ass line I had, but just know in case I don't show it, I had a like, gigantic line right down the middle from the headset. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. The next VR game I'll do, I have some other games I'm going to move on to, mainly Subnautica and Mass Effect are the two next big games I'm going to do. But in terms of the next VR game, it's probably going to be Into the Radius. I think that's what's called Into the Radium, something like that. <clears throat> that and then I have some others but that's the main VR game that I actually have planned to play next but the next two like big non-VR games I'm gonna play are Mass the Mass Effect trilogy I think it's a trilogy and then Subnautica and it's DLC those are the next two games I plan to play um you know new games might release here and there that kind of upset the schedule a little bit but that's what I have planned going for right now so um thank you so much for watching greatly appreciate it have a great day and uh, yeah see ya